In this video, I'm going to be going over a conservation of power problem. Now these generally start out with a circuit analysis problem where you have to find all the voltage and current values within your circuit. And then there's an extra step at the end where you have to verify that the voltage and current values that you found result in a total power for your circuit equal to zero. Now because of that, I'm going to start this problem off with the circuit analysis part of it. And I always do my circuit analysis the same way. I begin with labeling my component currents, my node voltages. I move on to writing KCL and the equations for my components. And at that point, I'm left with a system of equations that I can either plug into a calculator or solve by hand. So let's jump right into it and begin with labeling my component currents and my node voltages. So I need to make sure that every single component within my circuit has a defined current value, whether that's a number or a variable labeled for my circuit. So let's begin with labeling this first current over here. I'm going to call this I1, and I can call this I1 for both of these components because there's nowhere for that current to split off. If the current is flowing through this wire, it can't jump out of the wire and go somewhere else. It has to continue on through that 1 ohm resistor. However, at the 2 ohm resistor over here, I do need to define a new current. So let's go ahead and call this I2, and the direction that I'm choosing for these current values is completely arbitrary. You can make I2 pointing upward and that's totally fine. As long as you're consistent with how you do it in the following steps, it's gonna work out perfectly. Now for the two amp source, I could define some sort of I3 current for it, but that's kind of redundant because we know the value for this current source is two amps and we know the direction that it's going. So at this point, we're done with labeling our component currents and we can move on to label our node voltages. The most important thing to begin with with your node voltages is identifying where your ground is. Now this is an arbitrary reference and you can make this anywhere within your circuit. But this is the value, or the node rather, that has the value of zero with respect to anything else. So this is just a reference point that we're going to set, and typically by convention, this is placed at the bottom of your circuit. Although you could place it anywhere and you're still going to get the correct answer. So let's go ahead and call this our ground node, and we can move on to labeling our other nodes. Now a node on the circuit is any continuous piece of wire. So we labeled this bottom one. Let's go ahead and label this one over here uh, between these two elements, and we're gonna call this V1, and we can call this one over here V2, and that takes care of labeling our nodes. So at this point, we have completed step one, and we can move on to step two. Now in step two, we're going to be writing Kirchhoff's current law, and basically what this is, is just an expression that relates currents pointing towards a node, flowing into a node, to the currents that are flowing away from the node. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to start off with this node right here at V2, and let's write KCL at V2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the currents that are pointing towards that blue circle are equal to the currents that are pointing away from that blue circle. So we can see that I1 is pointing towards it, so we're going to say I1, and 2 amps is also pointing towards it, so plus 2 amps, is equal to the currents that are pointing away from it. In this case, it's only I2. So that is going to be equal to I2, and that takes care of KCL at node V2. Now we could write a KCL expression for V1. However, if we did, the expression would be I1 is going towards V1, but I1 is also going away from V1. And this should make intuitive sense that I1 is passing through that node and continuing on. So we don't have any kind of a junction there. So writing a KCL in this case doesn't really help you solve the circuit because you're not generating a useful equation. You're just saying I1 would be equal to I1. Now a similar thing happens at the ground node. So if you were to add the ground node, that actually is a redundant equation as well. So you don't need to write equations at the ground node. And as long as you label the same current going through two elements which are in series like this, you don't have to write a KCL there either. Just the junctions where you have this kind of intersection between your currents is important to write your KCL there. So we took care of KCL, but now we need to do our equations for components. So EFCs. And we can begin with our resistors. So the equation for a component is just the equation that governs how that behaves within your circuit. So starting off with our one ohm resistor, the equation for that component is Ohm's law. So what I can write is that I1 is equal to the potential across it. In this case, it's going to be V1 minus V2 divided by the resistance value. Now note, it's very important that you subtract in the correct direction, and that's based on the direction that this current is flowing. So you always want to subtract in the same direction. So we subtract between V1 to V2 because the arrow is pointing V1 to V2. Another way you could think about it is the current is the direction that the charges are moving, 
and the charges are moving to a lower energy state as they go from V1 to V2 because the resistor is consuming power. So this has to do with how power is calculated within the resistor. So let's go on to I2 and the 2 ohm resistor. So we'll say I2 is equal to potential across it V2 minus 0, our ground node, divided by the resistance of 2 ohms. Now we have to do the equation for our voltage source. So the equation for a voltage source is always going to be that the potential across the voltage source is equal to the positive side minus the negative side. So in this case, we're going to write 10 is equal to V1 minus 0. And that's all we have to do for the voltage source. Now, the 2 amp source that we have over here, we have already taken care of. And this is because we've included the information about the source within our KCL statement. So we wrote I1 plus 2 amps is equal to I2. That's all the information we have about that current source. So we're not able to write an additional equation there. So we don't know what the voltage across it is. We just know what the current through it is. And that's related in the KCL equation. So at this point, if you count the number of equations that we have and the number of variables that we have, you can see that we have a solvable system of equations because we have the same number of equations as we do variables. So let's go ahead and begin solving this by hand. So we know from this equation over here that V1 is equal to 10. So we'll go ahead and write that in over here. And we can plug that into our equations. And what I'm going to do to solve this is I'm going to plug in my 10 for V1. I'm going to put my I1 equation over here. And I'm going to put my I2 equation over here. That way I have a single equation with my only variable being V2. So what that's going to look like is 10 minus V2 divided by 1 plus 2 is equal to V2 divided by 2. So we can then go ahead and start combining things and we get 12 is equal to 3 over 2 v2 and that gives us a v2 value that is equal to 8. So we can go ahead and plug in that there and now that we know v1 and v2 we can solve for occurrence pretty easily. So for instance in i1 we have v1 minus v2 divided by 1 so it's going to be 10 minus 8 divided by 1 so we know i1 is going to be equal to 2 amps. Now for i2 we can just plug in our 8 divided by 2, and that's going to be 4 amps. And that takes care of solving the circuit. Now we know all the voltage and current values within our circuit. So the next step is to calculate the power absorbed or delivered by each element within your circuit. So this is going to be done the same way for every single element within your circuit. And if you use this method, there's no exceptions. You take the voltage difference across the component, and you multiply that by the current through the component. Now it's very important, just like in Ohm's law, that you subtract in the right direction. So you always want to subtract in the same direction that the current is flowing. So let's start off with the 10 volt source. And what we're going to do is we're going to subtract in the same direction that the current is flowing. So we can see the current is going from the ground node to V1. So that's the direction that we're going to subtract. So we're going to say 0 ground node minus V1 multiplied by I1. Now this is going to be 10 volts, that's the value of V1, multiplied by our I1, which is going to be 2 amps. So this is going to be equal to negative 20 watts. Now the negative sign is very important. What that tells you is that the 10 volt source is delivering energy to the circuit. Now, one way you can think about this that might make it a little more intuitive is that the negative sign or positive sign is with respect to the element. So if the sign is going to be negative, that means it's losing energy and energy is going out of that particular component. If the sign's positive, then the energy is going into that component. And that's the way I think about it to help that make a little bit more sense. Okay, so we know that this is going to be negative 20 watts, so negative 20. And because this is negative, we're going to say this is delivered. All right, moving on to the 1 ohm resistor. So what we'll say here is we'll do the exact same thing. We'll subtract the direction that the current is flowing. So we're going to say V1, which is 10, minus V2, which is 8, multiplied by the current, I1, and that's going to be 2. And that is going to give us a power of 4 watts. Now this case is positive. And for resistor, it's always going to be positive because these are elements that are taking electrical energy and turning it into heat. And that's always how they're going to work. If you ever analyze a circuit and you find that the resistor is giving you a negative power, you have made a mistake. And it's a good idea to check your work. So let's go ahead and put that there. So it's going to be four watts. And this is absorbed because this is positive. All right, moving on to our two ohm resistor. That is equal to V2 
which is going to be 8 minus 0 multiplied by the power, which is, or the current rather, which is 4. And that's going to give us 32 watts. So this is going to be 32. And this is absorbed. And now we're on to our 2 amp source. So again, no rules change. So power for the 2 amp source is going to be equal to the voltage across it and the subtracted in the direction of the current, which is 0 minus V2. And that's because we're pointing from the ground node to V2, right? And we're going to multiply that by the current of 2 amps. And that is going to be V2 is 8 multiplied by 2 is negative 16 watts. And this is going to be delivered again. So now if you add all of these up, you can see that the total power for the circuit is equal to zero. And that's what you should expect for every single problem that you do this for. If the total is not equal to zero, there is a mistake somewhere within the circuit and you have violated conservation of power.